Well, good morning, everyone. The title of this sermon series we're starting today is Answer. We'll be uh, doing that for the next three weeks. We're going to culminate it with Friend Day on the, uh, on the April 3rd, I believe it is. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So I always knock, speaking of answer, I always knock on the refrigerator door before I open it. You know why? There might be a salad dressing. <laughs> on a rainy day like today, I have a great joke about umbrellas. The only problem is it normally goes over people's heads. That being said, have you ever um, called or texted or reached out to someone only to be ignored? Have you ever, like, you know, sent that text and three days later they've read it, but three days later they still haven't responded? Anybody ever had that happen? Well, me and my wife, we had a big fight years ago because I had gotten a cell phone, and in my office over here, the old office, uh, my, my cell phone would not ring. And she would call me and get mad at me that I was ignoring her. And man, I'd come home and I would show her, look, dear, no missed calls. But it didn't matter. She was mad at me that I wasn't answering her phone calls. So I made a deal. We made a deal. And the deal we made is, is that I, if I'm in the middle of a funeral and she calls me, I'm going to go, oh, wait, everybody, <laughs> because I love you. But I love her a whole lot more. And I got to stay married to her. So I just want you to know if we're in a marriage counseling situation and you're crying or fighting or whatever it is, and my wife calls, I'm going to say, y'all hold on for a second. Wife, I'm in the middle of something right now. But why? Why? Because we made a deal that when she called, I would do what? Answer. Answer. That's our deal. So let me ask you a question. I always answer her regardless of where I am. Who do you always answer? Who do you always answer? Now, there's probably somebody in your life, if you don't always answer them, you should. Who do you always answer? Can I ask you a question? Who do you ignore? Come on. Group texts, I'm ignoring you. Group texts are from Satan. I do not understand why people think if you send out a group text question that does not require you to answer, why you answer? Stop it, people. Stop it. 45 texts later, I'm like, nothing was said that was of value other than the original one. Are, are y'all with me? Who do you answer? Who do you ignore? And now, we, on Wednesday night, you know, we have services here on Wednesday night. And this past week, Dwayne Davis did a great job. He was talking about how Elijah had met with God and how God called him and talked to him. And God didn't shout at him. God whispered to him. He whispered. So for, for Elijah to answer, he had to be close enough to God to hear what God was saying. Now, my wife, she has a habit in the morning of having her low voice, her low and sexy voice, yes. And she'll be in the shower, and she will talk to me while I'm in the other room. And I'm like, I can't hear you, baby. I got to get close. Oh, come on. All you husbands know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So I got to stick my head in the shower and say, what did you say, dear? You've got to get close to hear when somebody's talking low, right, and whispering. Who, you know, if God wanted to talk to you, you would probably need to get close to him to hear what he was having to say. And you also have to intentionally listen. You have to choose to answer. Who do you always answer and who do you ignore? So um, our, our video reminds us that what it's like, you know, come on, that, 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 didn't that just break your heart? You know, he's got ice cream. He's got joy. He's got things to share. And she's so 
cluttered with the noise of what is going on that she's ignoring what is best right before her. And that's how a lot of us are. Our lives are so cluttered with the noise of this life and what we're watching on TV and what we're listening to on the radio and all the voices in our head that we're ignoring the whisper of God calling us. And what I want to talk to you about today is I want to talk to you from Isaiah 42. And I'm going to show you the movement of Isaiah 42. We're actually going to walk through it. So if you've got a Bible, you're going to want to open it, and we're going to go to Isaiah 42, and we're going to walk through the story about how God is calling us, and we need to answer. This sermon series is about choosing to answer. So we'd, um, we're going to use the same passage all three weeks as our, our sermon text. So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet, if you would, in honor of God's Word. We'll go to Isaiah 42 in just a moment, but right now, I'm going to ask you to Look at the screen, and uh, it says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we'll share a meal together as friends. I like that version, the NLT. That's a good version this, for this one. Share a meal together as friends. So I'm going to ask you to do me a huge favor. Would you mind reading this out loud with me? Through three or four times reading this, maybe you might learn a new verse. So can we do it together? All right, here we go. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Father, I pray that today you would help us to open the door, that we would listen, we would answer, that we would respond to your invitation and we would answer the call, the call to bring restoration to this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Wait, don't, don't sit down. Don't sit down. Stop. Stop. Now, somebody came into this room today, and you didn't feel like you were loved, you didn't feel welcome, you don't feel like you belong. This is what we're going to do right now, if you, especially if you're that person. I want you to find somebody near you, and I want you to give them a big smile and say hi. Smile so they can see it. And you know what? All the rest of you do the same thing, but especially if you're at that person, and see what happens when you smile at somebody and say hi. Ready? Go. Hey, if you're online, <laughs> smile. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. God bless you. All right. We're in Isaiah chapter 42 this morning, and there are three distinct phases in this prophecy. There's phase one, there's phase two, and there's phase three. And these movements, there are, if you will, movements. And the first one we're going to look at is the one who does the calling, and the one who is calling is Jesus. Now, what we're going to find out is there's a prophecy in here that Isaiah, Isaiah probably didn't know fully what he was saying. I don't know, he might have. The Bible says that um, uh, in John that Isaiah prophesied the way he did because he saw Jesus in all his glory. That's in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, but I don't know if that's what's going on. There, there's a great question to be asked here. As a matter of fact, the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, when he was reading one of the passages of Isaiah, says, who's he talking about, himself or someone else? And I would answer to that question, yes. Now, what Isaiah does here, or the person doing the writing in this portion of Isaiah, chapter 40 is a little different. 40 through 66 is a different time period than chapters 1 through 39, and you can do your reading about that. But anyway, there's a lot of prophecies about Jesus in chapters 40 through, 40, uh, through 66, and in chapter 42, we run across one of those prophecies, and, and he starts by telling a story that sounds like it's intentional for somebody in his world but yet there's a bigger fulfillment of the prophecy. So years ago, we were out, uh, we were out in Colorado. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Pikes Peak. I don't know if anybody's ever seen Pikes Peak. But it's this 14,700 feet in the air, snow-capped mountain. And this mountain is here. And, but before you get to it, you know, you're driving across the plains of Kansas. You hit Colorado. And then all of a sudden, it starts doing this, Right? Do y'all don't know what I'm talking These are called foothills. And the foothills, if you're at the base of one of those foothills, looking at the top of the foothill, you can't see the mountain. But it is the beginning of the Rocky Mountains, but that's really the Rocky Mountains. Are y'all following me? 
That's really the Rocky Mountains, but these are the Rocky Mountains too. And that's what this prophet is doing when he's talking about maybe somebody's life in his world. He's looking at the hill, but what he doesn't realize is that the trajectory right behind that hill is the peak of Jesus. He might be talking about somebody saying something about how it fits their life, but what he's really talking about is the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Now, let's read it, and I think you'll understand. Um, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he brings forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teaching, the nations put their hope. So there are six statements about the Messiah, the coming Messiah, Jesus, in this passage that I think are only fulfilled in Christ, probably were not fulfilled in the original guy the way they were intentionally fulfilled in Jesus. And God used this to speak to us of the coming of Jesus so we would know that his nature and character and who he is. So the character of the one who calls us is Jesus. He is a servant. He's a servant and he's chosen by God. Some things we know about the one servant who is chosen by God. He upholds God truth. In the spirit of God is upon him. And with justice he speaks. So we know this servant is chosen by God. And he has the spirit of God and the justice of God. And all of those are embodied in his nature. The second thing we know about him, he will not cry out. It says right there in the passage. He will not cry out. Now, the, when I, all right, so I, I'm a Greek guy, not a Hebrew guy. So uh, I was work, when I'm working with the New Testament, it sort of goes a little easier for me. So I had to go back and do all my reading from my Hebrew dictionaries and lexicons and stuff. And as I'm reading, I, it became very clear uh, that the words he will not cry out means that he's not going to like cry out in pain. It's not just he doesn't make noise, but that he doesn't make noise expressing his own anguish or pain, but he's keeping that quiet. And that reminds me of what Jesus did. Matthew chapter 26, verse 63, it says about Jesus when he was attacked, when he was beaten, when he was turned over, and when he was crucified, he did not cry out, but he remained silent. The third thing we know about this, this one calling Jesus is that um, the one who calls us, who is Jesus, is that he was a bruised reed. A bruised reed, it says, won't break. A bruised reed. It's tenacious. It, it's sort of, sort of annoying. All right, so years ago, along the Arkansas River Bank, now, anybody ever crappie fish? Am I the only one that ever crappie fish? All right, there's a few. Now, back in Oklahoma, where I grew up in the Arkansas Delta, around the Arkansas River, there was a lot of crappie in those rivers and back creeks and stuff. And uh, to do that, we would just get a cane pole, and you'd put a little leader, you know, at the end, and you'd take that cane pole, and you'd dip into holes and catch the fish, Okay. The problem is cane poles cost money and we were poor, right? So you know what we did? My dad went, found this place down the Arkansas River, looked like this. Now, after we shooed the water moccasins away, we cut down to some cane poles, some eight, 10 feet cane poles, and we would pull them out. We brought them home and stripped all the stuff off of them, all, all the, the leaves and, and dried them out a little bit. And we had our fresh Oklahoma cheap cane poles. It was awesome. But one of them got goofed up in the cutting, so I, I decided I was going to break it. So I took this green bamboo shoot, the, the tree, and I whacked it against the tree thinking it would break. But you know what happened? It just splintered and bent. So I got mad that it didn't break, so I hit it again, and I hit it again, and I hit it again, and then I put my foot on it, and I tried to break it. I could not break that bamboo for anything. I finally, if I wanted to break it, you know the only way I could do it? I had to take a knife and cut it, because once it started splintering, it's like it actually got stronger, and it's resolved to not break. And that's what Jesus is represented in this passage. Come on. Come on. You think about it. You beat Jesus. You beat him. They beat him within an inch of his life, and then he still carried his cross part of the way. And then they crucify him on a cross, and he hangs there, and he's forgiving people while he's hanging there. Come on. He was a bruised reed, but he wouldn't quit, and he wouldn't break, and he wouldn't give up. 
And you know what else he is? He's a smoldering wick that won't go out. Anybody, anybody ever do this to your kids? Buy those trick candles? It's good when they're young, you know? And they're like three or four or five, and you put the trick candle on their, uh, on their birthday cake, and they blow it, and it's got a little bit of, I don't know, whatever it has inside, and it goes out for a second, and then poof, it pops back in there. Like, poof, poof. Anybody ever do that to them? Isn't that fun? I love messing with my kids. Any way I could to make their life miserable, that made me happy. <laughs> no, but that's, that's how Jesus is. You think you put them out. You think you snuff them out. You think you... Come on, they laid them in a grave thinking they had put them out. And on the third day, poof, there he is again. <laughs> he will not falter or be discouraged. That means no matter what you do to this Jesus, he just won't quit. I, I respect that. Come on. You, no matter what you do to this servant, he doesn't quit. You can reject him and think you're done with him, but he still keeps loving you. You can beat him, and by his stripes you are healed. You can kill him, but his blood establishes a new covenant. You can bury him. And he rises from the dead. No matter what you do to this, Jesus, this, this servant is a victor and an overcomer. Yeah. The last of all, the nations, they put their hope in him. Now, the nations put their hope in him. Not just one, all nations. Every tribe, race, and tongue, there are people who are following Jesus Christ today because this prophecy is fulfilled. You know, Matthew saw this. Matthew, when he was writing about what Jesus went through on one specific situation, in Matthew chapter 12, he says, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place and a large crowd followed him. So what did he do? You can't keep a good man down. So he starts healing people after they follow him. And he healed all who were ill. And he warned them not to tell others about him. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here, and he quotes this word for word. Jesus is the fulfillment of this passage. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I put my spirit on him. He will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out, and no one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed. He will not break. A smoldering wick, he will not stuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. I love that version even better. Jesus always wins. And you know what? One of these days, he's going to come riding back on a white horse. He's going to split open the eastern sky, and he's going to bring justice to this world. And all those who have opposed him will bow their knee before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that will happen. And all their nations will put their hope. And then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And what did Jesus do? He kept on healing so he could both talk and see. You want to know what Jesus does when you try to push him down? He shows you more love. He shows you more power. He shows you more grace. He shows you more victory. And if you think you can keep Jesus out of your life just because you might be a little ticked at him or you don't like it, you have no idea who you're messing with. Amen. Reminder of a story of this guy in the church named Willie Murphy. Willie Murphy, it's his famous line. He told me the first day I met you, I wanted to pick a fight with you. I wanted to punch you in the face. I was preaching about Jesus' love, and he didn't like it, and he came to fight, and God saved him. 18 years later, he's still, no, 23 years later. You know, Willie Murphy now leads an addiction group in our church every Monday. You know why? Because when you think you can fight against Jesus, you're not fighting a battle you're going to win. Jesus will always win it. Second of all, who are the ones that are being called? The one who's calling is Jesus. Who are the ones being called? And that's you and I. Listen, I figure the reason you're here today is you've got a little bit of faith growing in you. Maybe it's not this much faith. Maybe it's this much faith. And if you've got that much faith, if you've got that much faith, that's enough. Jesus said it only takes a mustard seed. That much the fact you're here today, you've got enough faith for Jesus to call you out of your normal into his best. So God is calling us. We read about this in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 5 and 6. 
This is what the Lord, or what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth and all that springs from it, who gives breath to all its people, to those and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you. We'll get to I, the Lord, have called you in a second. But let's talk about that first part. That first part is this. That is, all right, so I, like I told you, I had to do reading. So I went back and I was reading my big dusty books about this passage. And they said, this passage right here is how all the contracts and laws were written in those days. The first thing that's going on here is this, there's a statement about who is the power and then who is the representative of that power. The power is God, the one who created you. And you can tell me you're an accident, you're just an animal and you don't matter. Well, then I'm asking you, can I ask you a question? If you believe in evolution to the point that you're just an animal and you don't matter, then why do you care? If you care, that proves you're not just an animal. Listen, if there's something in you that says, that's not just, that's not right, I don't, I don't see antelopes arguing that when lions are chasing them. So why do you care? The simple fact you care means that you have the seed of God in you and that you're more than just an animal. You are created by a creator who made you for a purpose. All right, so God who made you, and he does something else. He puts his breath in you. And the fact that God gave you breath means that he has a purpose and a calling for your life. You have a reason for being here that's more than just for you to suck oxygen in and turn it into carbon dioxide so the trees can stay alive. You have a purpose. And God is calling you. This is, this is the messenger formula. This is the formula of God, the, the, all of the cultures of the nations. And God saying, yeah, well, I'm calling you. I'm calling you because I'm the power and I'm the real authority, not governments. I am. And he says that. Second, uh, verse 5 begins with a messenger formula that indicates that someone speaks with the authority and the commission from the king. The king himself is calling you to be his representative. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. God wants you to represent him in a sick world. God is calling you as Christ's ambassadors. We'll talk about that more next week. So what, what does he say to those of us that are called? Well, let's look at Isaiah 40, 42 again. This is what the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out who spreads out the earth and all that springs for them and gives breath to all people and life to all who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you, first of all, in righteousness. We'll come back to it, but let's read it. In righteousness. Second thing, I take hold of your hand. Third, I will keep you. Fourth, I will be a covenant for the people and a life for the Gentiles. Fifth, I will be to open the blind, to set captives free from prison, and to release from dungeon those who sit in darkness. God has a plan and a call for your life. So first of all, you are called in righteousness. You ever been right, but not righteous? I was... I had a fight with my wife one time, and I was right. I remember that day because that's the only time I've been right. <laughs> but I was right. And because I was right, I was going to make her see I was right, no matter how bad I hurt her feelings. So I was right, but I wasn't. Are, are y'all following me? Come on, come on, help me out. I may have been right, but I wasn't. You know, that's the problem the world has with Christians. I can't blame them. Yes, you're right. Sin is sin. But sometimes you're not righteous in how you point that out. Yes, you're right. God loves them and wants to save them. But sometimes you're not righteous in how you talk to people about it. God wants something out of you, and he wants something out of me to be more than just right. He wants us to be righteous. By the way, Isaiah felt this because in Isaiah chapter 6, you know, he says, God says, who will go? Who will talk for me? And he said, 
I will, I will. Horseshack, for those of you that are old. Horseshack, send me. And God says, oh yeah, I'm going to send you. So he said to the angel, take a, take a coal off of the altar and touch this guy's lips because he's unholy. And God made him righteous. And I I just want you to know that God wants to make you more than just right. He wants to make you righteous. He wants you to live in a way that your life exemplifies the love and the power and the goodness of God. Second of all, God wants to take hold of your hand. It's right there in the passage. He wants to take hold of your hand. So um, I played ball on Monday night with all the young studs. I'll call them young punks because they're young. They're young studs. We were in here playing basketball and Now, listen, I'm old. As a matter of fact, after I finished playing one game, the 18, 19-year-old boy comes over to me and says, how old are you? (laughs) Old enough to knock your front teeth out. No, anyway, sorry. (laughs) No, he said, how old are you? And I said, I got about 15 years on everybody in the gym. And he said, the biggest compliment I've heard in a long time. He said, you know, for an old man, you can ball. Come on, I, my, my head got big. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but I'd take the game off. I'd run a couple of games, and I sat down right back there on one of those chairs, and I sat down. And, uh, yeah, the old man has an issue, though. You run a couple of games, and you sit down. The knees all of a sudden tell you that you are 15 years older than everybody else in the gym. Right? The old man might be able to ball when he can get up and move. <laughs> So I'm sitting there, my knees are hurting, and I, I, I'm like, well, waited two games, and it was time. It was time to get up and play, and I'm like, no, no, it hurts. And yeah, my pride is saying, oh, yes, you can, and my knees are saying, oh, no, you can't. And about that time, one of the guys on my team, Anthony, comes over and he sticks his hand out. Come on. Somebody sticks their hand out to lift me up. I, what did I have to do, though, if I wanted to play? Come on. I had to reach out and take his hand. He took my hand, he pulled me up, and I screeched and popped a couple of times, and I went and played a couple more games. Because here's the deal. When somebody takes you by the hand, you take it because they're trying to lift you up from the pain in the place you're in. And God says, I not only want to make you righteous, I want to lift you out of that mess. I want to take you by the hand and pull you out of your mess. So God's calling you. He wants to make you righteous. He wants to take your hand. Third thing he wants to do is he wants to keep you. Can I, can I talk to you about this for a second? Because um, I got a grandbaby, and she's the cutest thing the world ever seen. She's adorable. She, I was keeping her the other day, and, you know, it was nap time, and she didn't want to go to sleep. Anybody ever had kids like that? Nap time, don't want to go. And it reminded me of my kids years ago. And I sort of did the same thing with her, but she's not nearly as stubborn as my kids. <laughs> I remember I had a kid one time, did not want to go to sleep. And, uh, and I picked that child up and I'm trying to put them to sleep because they're tired and they're grumpy and their eyes are red and they're screaming and fighting sleep. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And all of a sudden, baby, you know, kicking and screaming and fighting. You know what I did? You know what I did? I took that baby, I slammed it on the ground. No, 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 no. No, I didn't do that. What did you do to the baby? Come on. I, I held that baby a little tighter and I walked back and forth. And I, I, I began to sing. And as I would sing and pray over them and bounce back and forth, the more they would fight, the tighter I would squeeze. And the tighter I would squeeze and the more I would sing. They thought, they might have thought I was being mean or mad at them or something. Heck no, I was bulging with love. And sharing love in the moment and I was keeping them from the stupidity of their own behavior right and if you think God's mad at you he's not I don't care how much you've goofed up in your life God just wants to grab you a little tighter and the Bible says that he's singing songs of love over you to bring peace to your soul even when you're in the middle of the chaos this is the call of God you're called in righteousness he takes hold of your hand He keeps you. And then what happens is he makes you a covenant mediator. All right, so there were a couple of guys that I really loved one time, long time ago. They got ticked off at each other, and they weren't talking. So you know what I did? I started a campaign to get this one to talk to that one. You know why? 
because I love this person, I love this person, and I wanted them to be united in Christ. And, you know, eventually they got together and buried the hatchet and moved on with their futures. That's what God's called you to do. There are people in your life, there are people in your neighborhood, there are people at your workplace, there are people in your family that they're all ticked off at God for whatever reason. Your job is not to stand and condemn, but to reach out in love and reach out in love and to try to mediate between the two of them. And then last of all, you're called to be a light to the nations. Why, you say? Why, why are we a light to nations? Look at the end of this passage. Isaiah 42, 7 says that these who are called are to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from dungeon those who sit in darkness. Do you, do you know what God wants to do with you and through you? He wants you to be a darkness reliever. He wants you to be a light giver, a dungeon freer. I know, I know, you think people don't need it. I know you, you I, I know how it goes. Well, they're just fine. They don't need me to intervene with their life. Everything's fine in their life. And the deal is, is that we take the outward appearance of people's lives and we think that they're all all right, when on the inside, they're really not. The story is the story of a girl, her name is Judith Bucknell. The year was 1980 in Miami. She was homicide 106 that year. On a steamy June 9th evening, she was killed, age 38, weight 109 pounds, successful, apartment overlooking the bay, well-to-do and popular. But she kept a diary. We wouldn't know about the real her if she didn't keep a diary. Judy was not a prostitute. She wasn't on drugs. She wasn't on welfare. She never went to jail. She was not a social outcast. She was respectable. She jogged. She hosted parties. She wore designer clothes. She had a good job, had an apartment that overlooked the bay, and she was very lonely. She said, and I quote from her diary, I see people together and I'm so jealous. I want to throw up. What about me? What about me? See, she was surrounded by people, but she was on an island. She had many acquaintances, but few very close friends. She had a lot of lovers. She had 59 sexual lovers in 56 months, but no love. She said, who is going to love Judy Bucknell? This is her diary. I feel so old, unloved, unwanted, abandoned, used up. I want to cry and sleep forever. And she wrote, I'm alone. I want to share something with somebody. Now, if you looked at her life in her designer clothes and her fancy parties and her high-paying job and her great apartment, you would think she didn't have any needs. But on the inside, there's a part of her crying out for love that could only be met by the God who created her to give her breath and life. Your Listen to me. I read a, something recently saying millennials, over half of millennials say that it's a sin and it's wrong and morally unrighteous to try to convert somebody to your faith. Let me tell you something. I'm not trying to convert you to my faith. I'm trying to give you what your heart craves. And you're never evil when you invite people into this space and this place. It's a reason friend day, you know. I've read statistics, either seven, eight, or nine out of ten, depending on which study. But think about this. At the worst, seven out of ten people, if you invite them to be your friend on a friend day, will come to service with you. Seven out of ten, if you give them an invitation. You know what we're doing? We're ignoring the Judy Bucknells of this life when what they need is right here. Relationship with a family that accepts you regardless of how stupid you are because you accept this pastor even though he's stupid. And I set the bar low. And if I'm accepted, you are too. Come on. Right? Acceptance. Love and an opportunity to enter into the life of Christ. Invite somebody with you to Friend Day on April 3rd, okay? All right, last of all, we're going to end here. What's our response then to all this? 
our response is to worship. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, for I'm the Lord, that is my name, and I love this line, I will not yield my glory to another. You know, God's jealous. He will not yield his glory to another. He won't take his purposes for you and just remove them. No, he's going to make sure if he called you in righteousness, he's going to make sure you're horrible at sinning until you get rid of it. Come on, I used to be really good at sinning. I was really good at it. And it was fun because if, if you aren't having fun sinning, you're just not doing it right. The problem is, though, you ready? I gave my heart to Jesus and then it stopped being fun. That sounds like a losing deal. No, 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 no. My heart got filled. I, I became really bad at sinning. I never got caught before. But after I gave my heart to Jesus, I got caught every time. I never used to feel guilt, but after I gave my heart to Christ, oh, come on, man. I, I, what happens is, God, if you say, Lord, be my Lord, God's going to make you his Lord. You're, he's going to make himself your Lord. He's going to take you at your word. Because God's not going to yield his glory to another. He's not going to let sin rule over you. He's not going to let you get by with being stupid. He's not going to let you get by with this stuff. He's going to rescue you from it. Because God loves you so much, he wants what's best for you. And when you say yes to him, he's going to push you to make his best work in your life. He said, I won't yield my glory to another, my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and the new things I declare. I wish I had time for that. New things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them. You know, like Jesus being a, a reed that won't break and a candle that won't go out and somebody that'll bring justice to all the nations of the earth. Come on, I wonder if he did. Yeah, he did it. And then it says this, sing to the Lord a new song. Sometimes you've got to sing a new song, a different thing than you've done before. Give God the glory. Sing a new song. So I got to ask a question. I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes with me around this place. The question I got to ask you is this. Are you sitting here this morning and you have not made Jesus your Lord? Today, something is stirring in your heart. It isn't me. But something's stirring in your heart to make Jesus your Lord today. Today is your day. Today is the day. Right now is the time. God wants to do a new thing in you. He wants to change you and give you a hope and a future and that inner loneliness and that inner grief and that inner struggle. He wants to start moving to bring life in those spaces in you. Right now, right here, this moment. And if you want to receive him as your Lord, he's got his hand stuck out to you right now. So you know what you need to do? Just lift your hand up right now to accept it. Come on, lift your hand. If you're in this place, you want to make Jesus your Lord, lift your hand up right now. I want to pray with you. Yeah, are there others? Yeah, are there others? Come on, it's your day. He's calling you right now. He's got his hand out for you right now. Yes. Yeah. Could we all pray together? Nobody prays alone at Harvest Ridge. Everybody together. Everybody out loud. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for winning. For not being snuffed out. For not being bruised beyond usefulness. I trust you. I believe in you. Be my Lord. I know you're going to change everything. I'm looking forward to it. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, you know what just happened? You know what just happened? God took you at your word. You are a new creation in Christ. You are not the same old you. He called you in righteousness. Yeah. So here's how we're going to end today, all right? We've got a new song. Imagine that. I found this song. I thought, we got to sing this new song. So we're going to sing it. But what I would like you to do while we're singing this song is there are some of you 
you need to come to this altar and you need to kneel down and you need to talk to God about his calling upon your life. His calling to be more righteous. His calling to live in his trust. His calling to speak instead of being silent. There's some of you, I don't know, You maybe you need to stand, maybe you need to sit. I don't know what you need to do. But as we sing this song, I want you to talk to God about his calling to you right now in this space. Um, if you want to stand with me, if you need to stay seated, go for it. Do what you need to do. Let's sing this song together.